I'm Ryan Jeffrey, and this is the Passionate About OSS podcast. The purpose of the podcast is to shine a light on the brilliant minds of the OSS and telco industry, to describe their background, knowledge, tips, and some of the techniques they've developed over the years. In today's episode, we'll look at modern OSS BSS transformation techniques that really start with the customer. Our guest today has a track record of managing large-scale IT transformation programs in Tier 1 carrier environments in Australia and the UK. He's been in Telco for over 15 years, including nearly nine with MBN, Australia's wholesale network provider. And more recently, he's been guiding a significant transformation project at Vocus. He recently made a fantastic presentation at a TM Forum event in Sydney that relates to his work at Vocus. And that was so impressive that we published a blog article about it. We'll dive deeper into that transformation today. And that's just one of the reasons why I'm really excited to have our guest on today's episode. So welcome today to Martin Pitto. Thanks for having me, Brian. Really appreciate it. Great to have you on. So Martin and I first met around four to five years ago when he was program manager of network assurance at MBN. I was consulting on the PNI solution that his team maintained. That must have been fun, being accountable for a bunch of business-critical applications and infrastructure. No pressure, right? No after-hours change management or anything like that, Martin? (laughs) Oh, look, the benefits of being the program manager is uh, delegation, isn't it, Ryan? So uh, I left left those late nights to to others. But uh, but look, I guess there's many challenges when you work on, uh, you know, national-scale infrastructure like, you know, like the NBN. Um, And you've touched on the life cycle for technology capabilities, but of course, there's also security, customer experience, building capabilities that really support innovation. um, And that uh, challenger mindset are all things that I think are, uh, you know, come to play when we're uh, working on programs like uh, that network assurance at NBN. And we'll definitely get into a little bit more about that later on, but really that was far from your first OSS BSS project. So maybe first we'll dive back a little bit deeper into the recesses of time and and your career. As I understand it, you started out at Rockwell after finishing a Bachelor of Eng at uni. Now you have to excuse my ignorance, but I kind of equate Rockwell as being an IAC or industrial automation and control type company used for factories and other industrial complexes. Is that the kind of work you were doing there? <laughs> actually, uh, actually far from it. You know, Rockwell's a, a, a very large company, certainly back in those days, and I actually worked for Rockwell Systems Australia, and that was under the uh, Aerospace Defence Division of, of Rockwell International. When people think of Rockwell, they're probably best known for the, uh, you know, the American B-1 Lancer bomber. I think um, also, uh, you know, they looked after the Space Shuttle Orbiter. Um, and back in my time as well, they were responsible for other GPS satellites. But but look, uh, in those days at Rockwell, I was working on the Collins-class submarine, which are, I know if your listeners know all about that, but, but Rockwell was supplying various sort of elements, particularly associated with the combat system back then. So it was, uh, look, it was just a great... It was a great landing spot and a great uh, a great organisation to uh, to start off in. That sounds fantastic. I hadn't realised it was relating to the Collins class subs, but I won't dive into those questions because you'd have to shoot myself and all of the audience listening. <laughs> uh, well, well, actually, just uh, you know, just on that, it was a, an awfully complicated. Uh, a combat system, and it uh, and it turned out that uh, um, you know we bit off probably more than we could chew as an organisation back then, and uh, that combat system ended up being replaced by an American system. So not necessarily something that I underscore in my CV, but there you go. No, no. <laughs> and interestingly, it's an area of fascination for me just the how to relate those combat systems with command and control as it uh, translates to, say, a knock in a telco environment or a security operations centre. Did you see any real parallels? The, the, In theory, being super mission critical, life critical, uh, the combat systems to how we visualise and present data in, in a knock or our command and control OSS, BSS. Yeah, look, I think I, look, I think there are some parallels back in those days. I mean, goodness, um, the the sort of submarine, its detailed design started off. I want to say around about um, 1986, would you believe? Mm. And I joined the organisation back in um, in 91. So, so it was truly a, a full 
systems engineering mindset focuses on what they call HMI or the human machine interface was important because, of course, if you're in a stressful situation, the ability to, to present information clearly, concisely, you know, that so called actionable information, super important. But also, there was obviously a large scale design around redundancy, a, a quadruple redundancy for, a, a, you know, a lot of the systems. But with that redundancy comes a lot of challenges around keeping information synchronized, et cetera, across all of those nodes. And, you know, when I think back to it, it um, the thing that ultimately undid it, it had a, um, a mean time between failure of around about an hour, hour and a half, and it took about 12 hours to reboot. So I think, you know, <laughs> it, was not, it, was not a, it was not a good situation. But having said all of that, it really did ground me in some, uh, some useful fundamentals that I, uh, you know, that I took forward. Still apply today, and so are you able to describe just the in a, at a high level what some of those foundations that you developed from there? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I, I think I look at it from the point of view that um, if we, we discuss the combat system, it's obviously a very large sort of complex um, undertaking, and the groundings were really those around the sort of systems engineering, and that had all that sort of elements of you know, taking lofty objectives and, you know, hard deadlines, copious amounts of political, public scrutiny. It, I guess, rightly comes with projects that spend that sort of large amount of public money. But these projects require collaboration and coordination across multiple partners and suppliers. You've got to deliver against, you know, well-defined capabilities and interfaces. And all of this should sound familiar. That sort of approach, that systematic thinking approach, I think is important, but also I guess as a young engineer, I got to work with some very talented and seasoned veterans. And when I when I look back over my career, I sort of think that the experience that I had back then, although it's appropriate for the scale and complexity of that sort of project, it's that traditional waterfall, you know, highly constrained, lots of gates and this sort of stuff. So understanding where to apply that rigour and where not to really mm-hmm. help me balance this sort of speed versus that rigour, if you will, to apply various methodologies when you take into consideration team size, dynamics, business criticality, et cetera. So certainly later on, when I was thinking about methodologies, I'm able to pick and choose and sort of say, well, you know, this sort of approach, getting um, an element of that end-to-end architecture bedded down so that if you're putting an agile overlay over the top of it, you've got, you know, you, you're making decisions with a strategic intent in mind, I think, were uh were some good lessons that I took out of that uh, that period of my career. I love it. And I love the the parallel universes, how you can still uh, bring parallels back into the telco world and having that grounding outside the, the world of telco. And hmm. so well, from Rockwell, you then moved on to Fujitsu, which is a name perhaps more synonymous with telco, in my mind at least. That was back in the heady days when Fujitsu was providing a lot of SDH digital backbone to carriers around the world. My first real job was a three-month contract upgrading Fujitsu equipment uh, in many of the remote parts of Australia. So were you also working on the SDH gear and the the Flexar Plus NMS that was quite revolutionary for Fujitsu at the time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's uh, that's spot on. Um, That was back in in the mid-90s and, you know, the Australian arm of Fujitsu was very much focused on the local development of um, an SDH-based DSLAM, what we call the FSX 2000. Um, And that was an important part of the build-out of uh, Optus's initial network that that I was working on. I'm sort of mindful there's plenty of acronyms there, but um, (laughs) but essentially, you know, the DSLAMs are, you know, the network equipment that sits in that local exchange and provides for that sort of data connectivity to the home. It reuses a copper pair. I'm sure many of your listeners know about ADSL, and I guess the ADSL was the first generation of technology um, after dial-up that provided for that sort of adaptive but faster internet speeds. It's really interesting because if you think about it, that technology is relevant even today, what, 25 years later, because it, it, it's still it's still used in the NBN that underpins both the fibre to the node and fibre to the curb you know, access technologies. But I joined Fujitsu um, at that time um, as a hardware engineer working on that SDH backhaul. And that, inv- and that was pretty interesting, you know, it involved a combination of circuit card design, logic design, and back then we used a technology called field programmable gate arrays, which are mm-hmm. kind of a programmable chip, I guess. And that dramatically allowed us to increase the density of the sort of logic that would fit on a card. 
But, you know, unlike software design, when you, you can rapidly cycle between that sort of concept build test, if you get it wrong, well, it's, you know, you can rework it pretty easily. There's really nowhere to hide if you muck it up with, uh, with the hardware. You've got to really have that right first time mindset. You don't want to be knocking on your boss's door saying, sorry, I've got to redesign, the, the, you know, the card and the cost and the delay that comes on from that. So um, uh, back in those days, Interestingly, the simulation tools, the hardware levels and logic level simulation tools played a big role in, um, in getting it right first time. Fantastic. And in fact, it was probably that FPGA upgrade that got me that first job out in the field and <laughs> going around upgrading those uh, those chips and those cards around the network, which was great fun. But uh, yeah, I also made a huge blunder on that where I, I stuffed up a, a card swap out and it took part of the Optus mobile network down for it about 20 minutes and probably cost them a, a few million bucks. So one of the biggest blunders of my, my career today. We've all got our skeletons in the closet. <laughs> indeed, indeed. My kind of excuse was that it was at the end of a 108 hour week too. So uh, yeah, my mind, mine probably wasn't as uh, functional as it might have been at the start of that week. Also, whilst being an NMS really, was Flexar Plus really your first foray into that parallel universe of OSS? Yes, I think I think that's true. It's certainly the case that Flexar Plus was the network management system that was used to manage um, this DSLAM, the FSX2000. And if I sort of remember correctly, back in those days, the NMS uh, provided, I guess at best, an ability to manage a range of um, equipments, but across only a single vendor. Um, there was very little integration back up into the, the you know the OSS at the time. And back then, MTOSI, now don't ask me what the acronym was, I can't remember, but MTOSI was defining the northbound interface back up from those NMSs back up into the OSS. But there was very little adoption around that, and I guess only partial adoption of the underlying inventory models, which in those days was driven out of Etsy. Mm. So all of that meant that there were very little integrations. The, the integrations that did exist were really cumbersome, and we were really hamstrung, I think, as an, as an industry because there was a lack of vendor interoperability. Basically, the NMS, uh, the NMS was locked down and the vendor said, no, nope, you can only use it to manage our equipment. As you can understand, you can't use that NMS to manage others. I think we live in a very different world today. Yeah, so it would have been fully swivel chair integration then? Very much so. Whilst the MTOSI provided a northbound interface, the real challenge when I reflect on it was was getting those inventory models right. And they were, they were very complicated inventory models too, but largely you had to implement them bespoke and then, uh, you know, align them across your various bits of vendor network equipment. That's a non-trivial task. Mm -hmm. And then Fujitsu also took you over to the UK for a couple of years to help implement the structural separation of BT, didn't it? Yeah, they did. Um, that was back in um, 2006. It was an amazing opportunity. Yeah, at that time, Fujitsu was building out BT's next generation network alongside Huawei um, under a program they called the 21CN or 21 Century Network. And at that time, BT was very much the dominant market operator and it had a significant advantage through their vertical integration. Um, and Ofcom, who's the UK's regulator, at that time undertook a competition review and they basically concluded that BT needed to separate its wholesale and retail businesses from the underlying network infrastructure. Now, that's, again, non-trivial. The separation basically involved not only organisations, so they'd separate, literally had to separate their offices um, from the various business units. They had to separate their governance, etc. But importantly, it also entailed the separation of its massive OSS and VSS mm -hmm. estate. And Ryan, if I recall correctly, there were some 3,000 applications that were initially identified as being potentially impacted. And it also, it also involved the stand-up of, of a new network business, and that was, that was OpenReach. And the OpenReach effectively was set up to provide a set of wholesale services and common access to its physical infrastructure on standard terms to any carrier. Now, for those paying attention, <laughs> you notice this is exactly the model we followed here in Australia with standing up the EMBN. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll, we'll get to that really shortly too and that, the structural separation here in Australia and mm -hmm. the, the use of a lot of the learnings from OpenRanch. Also, we, 
We almost crossed paths there at uh, Fujitsu. We almost crossed paths at El Cartel Lucent too, where you were a senior solution architect shortly after I departed. What was your role there? Was it on the Telstra Transformation Project as well? Yeah, it, it was. So I joined El Cartel Lucent, oh goodness, I think it was around about 2009 when I returned from the UK. And yeah, I was, um, I was part of the Telstra tr- uh, Transformation Program. That, now, that was a huge program. There's no doubt it was BSS, OSS and network. But I guess I was more focused on the OSS and network aspects under what Telstra called the Titan program. And, you know, I looked after a range of solutions covering uh, mostly the access and edge of Telstra's network and also part of their mobile network. But for me, the most interesting element of that was uh, nail biting, I guess, was um, looking after the migration of Telstra's entire enterprise and government services from their legacy ATM network across to their next IP network. And I've got to tell you, that was 18 months of war rooms and early morning calls. <laughs> and I've got to tell you, I'm, still, I'm probably still carrying some of those battle scars. And did you develop a combat system for there and bring the rocket one across? <laughs> no, no, not at all. It was essentially, it was um, developing a set of, you know, un- underlying equivalent capabilities on the next IP network and a set of tools to do the migration. But then that 18 months was effectively the execution and invariably, you know, things didn't always go to plan. So those early morning calls were about triage and mop-up, effectively, right? <laughs> I like the use of the word execution, too. How many people were executed as a result of that, that piece of work? That's right. That's right. No animals were harmed, I can assure you. <laughs> and from from that role, you then shifted across, as you said, to the brave new world of FNBN. The first six years there saw you really responsible for the business-to-business interfaces. So, again, not dissimilar to, I guess, some of the pressure you would have felt on the the Telstra transformation project as well and really allowing MBN to connect to its customers. It's a pretty important role that you landed in, covering representation to stakeholders, government, MBN execs, RSP, telco users all across Australia were all dependent on those interfaces that you were building. Yeah, I'd been angling for the role, frankly, uh, for the MBN since I'd returned from the UK. I, I guess I saw it as a logical extension to the work that I, I did with OpenReach, mm-hmm. which I guess in part also involved their customer-facing B2B platform. You know, interestingly, I first applied at the MBN for a solution architect role, but I was guided by the, the good folk at MBN to take on that uh, industry integration manager position. But it's really funny how serendipity works because it turns out it was an opportunity to put my years of experience in sort of network OSS, BSS, even operations and regulatory into good effect. Because when I joined the MBN, it was, it was early days. We, we just finished mapping out the BSS OSS solution, which I guess actually itself was a unique opportunity to do that in a fully greenfield situation. Mm-hmm. We very rarely get that opportunity. But anyway, in my role, I was responsible for working with all of our retail service providers uh, to define, I guess, build and onboard them to NBN's B2B. There's lots of elements in terms of how I would term success, but I think defining the interface and, and the process is really only part of the problem. It's as much about providing, I think, a collaborative environment that ensures, you know, RSPs fully understand how they are going to best leverage those processes to advocate and deliver on a great customer experience because you've got to think about it. The NBN effectively was underpinning the entire fixed line telecommunication network here in Australia. So there's a, I guess there's a significant opportunity to positively improve the experience of RSPs and end customers. But you know what? To some extent, there's also a risk that if you get it wrong, you can end up with more than just angry customers. So taking that sort of collaborative approach um, rather than maybe a traditional approach of here's the interface, it's our way or the highway, was a mindset that I took into the NBN. But I also need to be fair, that B2B interface was very much driven at, you know, collaboratively through the Communications Alliance. Mm-hmm. And, that's, and that was a great approach because it was a way to gain consensus, thrash it out, where it's not seen as um, NBN taking a particular position, but genuinely trying to listen to what's what our customers need and develop that interface in the best interest. And I think the other thing that I'd reflect on is that we're not silos. Um, that the work that we uh, that the Comms Alliance used was very much based on that 
work that OpenReach did mm. that was contributed into the standards body. So I think in recognition, the fact that, you know, we basically built on the top of the foundation of others, I felt it was really important to take that collaborative approach. And then ultimately, as we we can touch on later on, is that what I was able to achieve at NBN was to contribute back into the, the telemanagement forum our APIs and the common information model, that in effect kickstarted the TMF open API work that was done. I guess it was also really important, the comms alliance, because it really gave voice to some of the little guys too. It wasn't just you were designing those interface for the the behemoth telcos here in Australia, but also all of the little service providers. Yeah, look, it's a good point. And I think, I think the thing that we all need to be mindful of is that an API that sits on the shelf is useless. So you've got to understand adoption and what drives adoption. And you have to have an understanding of what the uh, operational, I guess the commercial uh, environment is that all of your players are operating in. You've got to be mindful that you, you, you lower the barrier to implement. And that means at, at the time of the NBN, we basically ended up with a range of different technologies. You know, we had the traditional portal, which is, you know, for those that don't want to invest in in business-to-business integration can still have an equivalent capability on the portal, albeit swiveling into it. We went down the path of a so-called EBXML technology for NBN initially. And by the way, we took that approach not only because it was the same approach taken at OpenReach, but it, it provides out of the box for, you know, security and, and what we call non-repudiation, you know, but basically the building blocks in terms of connectivity between the gateways just comes out of the box. But it's also awfully expensive and very constrained in implementation. And down the track, NBN then also implemented um, REST-based APIs Mm -hmm. um, as an alternative, and those were better suited to more traditional web development methodologies. And and those sets of APIs um, were what spawned the the TMF APIs. Mm -hmm. And would have been a much greater uptake, as you said, because it was in the hands of uh, more of the web developers and so forth. Hmm. It was actually in your next role, again at MBN, where we finally did cross paths officially. And it was a case, I guess, of out of the frying pan and into the fire when you went from industry integrations to network assurance. And without those systems, an MBN would have been unable to handle incidents, change, customer notification. It wasn't just a case of keeping the lights on for those mission critical systems, but it was significant transformation underway for you and the team to manage those two, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah, I guess it was. And um, look, when I think about the sort of, when I say, you know, the IT sort of journey within NBN, it's probably useful just to sort of break it down. I guess there were sort of three phases. Phase one was all about building out the network. Um, It was really focused on the network design and build. We only had a small footprint of the network. So in those early days, we could get by with a pretty limited BSS sort of OSS solution that was more focused on front-end sort of customer order management and billing and, and also being able to activate and assure the network, but plenty of swivel chairs in, in that. Then we moved on to a faster cadence of product launches, and those were heady days, you know, when in rapid succession we did the fibre, you know, we launched a couple of satellites, we had HFC, FTTN, and all of that necessarily required stand-up of, you know, additional applications. We needed to get rid of those manual swivels in order to be able to scale. And that lent us more towards, I guess, the more traditional outsourcing type approach. We had a number of big partners. Big, you know, we, we played the, the role of a, a prime SI, but we had a number of big players there um, helping and supporting stand that up. And then, and then after we sort of did those product launches, we transitioned into what I would think of as a more traditional sort of delivery cadence where we've got, fewer big major releases, but we need to be more nimble, more efficient in the way that we we do those deployments. Mm -hmm. And so I guess the transformation that you're referring to relates to our move from that sort of larger scale systems integrated pattern to a scaled agile approach. And when I joined that uh, network assurance team, you'll remember we had one of the largest delivery outfits in the NBN with around about 150 devs, leads, solution designers, operational support. Mm -hmm. But I'd have to say... That sort of journey to scaled Agile took us a good 12 months and there were so many twists and turns along the way. Some of the challenges that we faced included that quite significant cultural mindset that needs to, to, to be in place. 
a move away from that sort of command and control more towards servant leadership style, but also, you know, the buy-in from our business exec to um, commit not insignificant resources to be able to support that sort of really close collaboration that Scaled Agile really requires. I really felt like the first few releases, probably the cadence actually slipped in terms of productivity as people got to, to understand Agile, but then once Agile really took off and people got used to it, the, the next PIs were getting better and better and within the, the first few quarters, things were probably to a faster cadence, better cadence than they were beforehand. But what were your recollections of what worked and what didn't through that transition to Agile? Yeah, look, um, it's very true. It's a, um, it's quite a shift in the in the mindset, and very definitely, you know, there's uh, there's pit, there's pitfalls, and I think the real the the real challenge that we had is that there was plenty of unknowns. We hadn't been through that journey before, and so one of the things that I think really helped us along that journey was that we partnered with some fantastic mentors and coaches, people in the industry that had done this type of journey before that could really shine a light on where on, on where the problems were. When I think about some of the key success factors, I get I guess it's really important that you have buy-in, that you you take people on the journey. You can very clearly articulate um, the vision. So here we are today, where do we want to get to? Uh, why are we undertaking this journey? And for people, it's really important that they understand what does it mean for them. Otherwise, it's like any big change program, you're going to face resistance. But I think the other one of the other key things is I mentioned that it's really important that you get the buy-in from the execs because they have to they have to commit not only you know, additional resources. So in Scaled Agile, we call those the product owners. They're the business representatives that have effectively got to co-locate and sidle up with the delivery teams that do everything from, you know, helping define requirements to validating assumptions to to working on, the, you know, the breakdown of those requirements into, into, you know, small packages of work, getting involved in acceptance testing. It's a huge commitment, but it is fundamental to getting Scaled Agile right. Yeah, absolutely. And I really feel like big OSS projects, it's all about momentum of the project. The breakdown of work is so important. It probably required a slightly different mindset to the breakdown of work. But if you yeah. if you get that right, you can really demonstrate a lot of more, more progress in small steps than you can with a big bang OSS BSS launch. Yeah, yeah, of course. And if I'm if I'm honest as well, I'd sort of say that getting that mindset getting that culture right is vital mm. but you've got to be realistic not everyone is going to be on board and certainly in my experience not everyone was on board so whilst you want to help every individual with that transition it's also important that you are realistic and if you've got people that are not on board and not supportive you've got to be prepared to make some hard decisions because Otherwise, um, that can really impact culture and the progress within uh, within the team. So it was certainly some of the challenges that we had with that uh, with that team of 150 getting us uh, getting us across the line in that in that journey. Yeah, it was a fascinating time. And after that eight plus year stint at MBN, then you moved on to Vocus. Are you able to tell us a little bit about Vocus's size, scope, products? Yeah, for sure. Well, look. Um, Oh, Vocus is a is a, a, a what we call a challenger. We like to call ourselves a challenger um, telco, the leading sort of specialist in the fibre network solutions provider space. We own and operate a significant uh, fibre network, about thirty thousand kilometres of fibre. It's all purpose built and it includes about fifteen thousand kilometres of terrestrial fibre that connects all of our um, our capital and regional centres. Um, we've got coastal and inland inland routes as well that support uh, low latency and redundancy. We've also got what we call an ASC, Australian Singapore cable. It's a, a 60 terabyte cable. It's about uh, about 5,000 kilometres. Um, we've also got a, um, a northwest cable system that connects the Australian continent with uh, some of our offshore um, oil and gas facilities between um, Darwin and Port Hedland. And also, um, Vocus has got a 6,000-kilometre regional backbone 
Black Spots program, which is operated by by us on behalf of the Commonwealth Government. So we've got a fantastic fibre asset. In terms of our sort of product offerings, they're pretty broad. They span everything from networks and connectivity, and that and that's your you know your traditional Ethernet, IP, WAN, internet, transit, dark fibre type products. We also look after workplace collaboration. That's your telephony, SIP, Zoom collaboration. And also, if I'm honest, you know, we've got some dusty products in there on PSDN and ISDN as well, but also platforms and security. And that includes infrastructure as a service, Google Cloud, managed services, data center locations, et cetera. The area of focus that I'm involved in really focuses on enterprise government and wholesale, although the focus group itself also has uh, a few retail service providers that folks would know, and that's um, Doho and, and Primus. Yeah, absolutely. Some really interesting brands in there, as well as a, a really important infrastructure footprint to support diversity in Australian telco. And in your 18 months there so far as principal IT architect, you've already tackled some of the really important transformation part of the journey that we alluded to in the intro. But before we dive too deep on that, are you able to describe a little bit about your remit? Yeah, sure. So, um, well, here at Focus, I'm an end-to-end solution architect for our Future State program. And that um, effectively, the Future State program squarely targeted leveraging this fibre network together with some next generation network capabilities to be able to blend that with sort of cloud and our infrastructure, managed service offerings to I guess, bring to light how we tend to be a real challenger in the market. But in terms of my role, it's very broad. Um, it spans largely the BSS uh, and OSS with a little bit of a sort of tentacles down into the into the network. Um, but it's really focused on ensuring that we and our partners have a well-defined solution across all of our business domains, applications and technologies. But, of course, it's not me alone. I've, I'm well supported by a talented group of enterprise architects and those, those guys map out um, you know, strategies, principles, some of the things I'm sure we'll talk about today, and also our in-state architecture and also a group of, you know, domain level subject matter experts. But, um, but yeah, basically I look after the overall BSS OSS and, you know, making sure that we are uh, we don't have too many gotchas when it comes to that uh, user acceptance testing. Easier said than done, though. Indeed. Yeah, so does it also cover into a push into data science, process re-engineering, things like that as well? Probably uh, data science, yes, to the extent that we are moving towards, we're not there yet, but we're moving towards uh, what some folks would call closed loop automation, what we call at the NBN cognitive operations. And it's effectively mm-hmm. saying, hey, we want to leverage M, you know, machine learning you know, slash AI to, uh, to do some pretty smart and clever things. Well, in order to get there, for example, requires, you know, a well-constructed information model and uh, what I would call data-complete inventory. So we can see that closed-loop automation on our, our horizon. What we're focused on in the near term is making sure that we've got the solution, the data models, and if you like, the catalogue and validation rules around it to make sure we are data-complete when we, uh, when we launch these, uh, these products. Yeah, absolutely. Great touch point too on the, the cognitive assurance and the fact that the, the data and all the building blocks have to be in place. You can't just put this miracle system on top that solves all those problems if there's data integrity type issues. Indeed, indeed. Are you able to describe for us why this transformation is so important to the future of Ocus and perhaps a little bit about the legacy that you're looking to overcome as well? Yeah, yeah. Well, Vocus, uh, uh, Vocus has, has had many acquisitions over the past couple of years, and that's really challenged us in terms of um, our ability to scale. And would you believe that we've needed, um, through those acquisitions, to maintain no less than six legacy networks and at least that many um, legacy BSS stacks? So... That's quite a challenge for us. So we started this transformation journey back in 2019. And it's probably fair to say that whilst, you know, the, that, that catalyst was to say we, we, we've got this fantastic network in terms of an asset, but we want to introduce a so-called software-defined network or program or network. And in order to do that, we needed to really sit down and address the problems that stem from those acquisitions. And those challenges, those problems were not only pain points for us, um, but also importantly for our customers as well. 
So when we think about this transformation journey, we it's probably worth just reflecting on what some of those pain points really, you know, really were. And I'll just throw a couple of things out there, and I'm sure some of this is going to resonate with some of your, your listeners, but we had this huge inflexible product catalogue. Every combination of price points um, reflected as an entry in our catalogue, and I kid you not, we had over 60,000 um, SKUs or individual, you know, orderable products within our catalogue. Can you imagine um, what that challenge is for both our customers and our sales team to find the right product? And invariably, if they couldn't find the right product, they'd throw their hands up and just create a new one. It just exacerbates the problem. And with no catalogue integration, the process to define any new offering is manual. Um, And, of course, you can see the issues that that throws up in terms of um, inventory management and, and the like. And, uh, you know, another aspect that each of our products, each of these SKUs is defined as a single specification, big flat specification. So there's no concept of reusing common network assets or reusing fibre or all that sort of stuff. And our quotes process similarly was largely manual, what we call price on application. So customers could go to a portal, request a quote, but it effectively fell out to our sales team to have to have to manage um, and, and I guess do that heavy lifting. And the fact that we had, you know, these IT silos meant that there was no single view of um, information, be that across our customer view, be that ac- across our network view, there was no sort of complete accurate inventory. And also just in terms of our customer portals, very disjointed experience, depending on um, the segment, um, the type of customer that you were or the type of product that you were interested in. You you could have to jump around a range of different portals with a range of different integrations and experiences. So, um, so look, that's where we were, but it also gave us clear line of sight to the sort of outcomes that we needed to achieve through this uh, through this transformation. A really common experience that you explained there. I think a lot of the listeners would uh, relate to that too. And being a challenger means that you have to be really nimble with your business model. Yeah. You can't be nimble with the business model if you've got so many moving parts, the OSS, BSS, and 60,000 SKUs means it's almost like every service for every customer is bespoke. And exactly. the ramifications yeah. of that for support, for testing, for the OSS build and everything else uh, falls out of that. And so you've been responsible for a number of OSS and BSS builds and transformations over the last couple of decades. But I get the impression that there were some really important differences with this one, uh, such as using an open rather than proprietary API stack. What were the, the similarities and differences with this focus transformation? Yeah, yeah. look, uh, yeah, it's true that I think as an industry, um, just in recent times, we've seen some really significant movement in the development and I guess the uptake of those open APIs. And I think there's probably been a number of drivers as to why that's been the case. There's been a real focus on value chain. So that is that we're recognising that the customer experience really requires that all suppliers are pulling in the same direction. Also a focus on data. You know, this notion of transparency, timely communications, meeting your commitments, all of these things require complete and joined up information right across the enterprise. But I think also more broadly, in my mind, what really moves the needle here at Focus is the realisation of what we call a dynamic architecture. You see, in responding to some of these challenges and constraints, you know, in our legacy systems, you know, we're about making things better, simpler, easier. And, you know, we have, a, we have a bit of a catch cry here at, at Focus and it's called Brilliant Made Simple. And that dynamic architecture really does underpin this goal. And I'm happy to un- unpick that a bit more, but what stands under that dynamic architecture, it's realised by a range of things, but certainly those open APIs are an important part of the picture. And I think the important thing is that at this point in time, there is now good maturity in the API definitions the associated processes, definitions in um, the information models, but also importantly, our vendors and partners have a real and tangible capability um, today on the on the applications and pretty strong roadmaps that make realising these visions um, just that much simpler. 
Yeah, really good point too. So you talk a little bit about those partners. Were they really, because they do these projects on a regular basis, were they the ones kind of helping to helping you to champion some of those modern practices or was that really your internal team guiding that and then delegating to the the likes of Sienna and Digit to, to then go and implement to those standards? Yeah, yeah, great question. Look, it's probably a combination of my enterprise architecture colleagues because really, you know, they set the direction here at Focus and they'd set that direction uh, before, you know, before I landed. But it is also a collaboration with our partners. And in our case, it's Digit, which is a local group here in in Melbourne, and uh, and Sienna Blue Planet. But I also want to recognise, I think, the valuable work that both the MEF and the TMF have done in their respective open architectures. In the TMF, we used to talk about process frameworks and standard applications and, you know, rigid information models. Um, But the TMF Open Digital Architecture, for example, it's all about catalogue-driven products and services underpinned by a common information model. And that really allows for discovery, exchange of offerings at runtime that are well-specified, that allow our providers and consumers to really rapidly deploy um, new products. So, look, it was a combination of that sort of clear technology architecture, a roadmap to get there, and and the capabilities that are uh, with our partners. But I also think one of the things, at least from a technology standpoint, that was front of mind uh, when we looked to partner with Sienna and Digit is that I've, I've got to tell you, there's an air gap that exists between a paper specification and building and deploying a capability in production. And both Sienna and Digit, uh, you know, this, the, these open APIs and the principles that underpin this dynamic architecture really are in their DNA. They're not only thought leaders in um, the standards, um, you know, setting the, the paper-based standards, if you will, but they're also involved in what the Telling Management Forum call catalysts. And these catalysts are almost like um, incubators, if you like, and they, they work on real-world problems. Often those problems come to the catalysts through, uh, through service providers like, like BT and Telefonica and Orange, at and even Bogus. But around that problem, they'll effectively realise a proof of concept. Um, so you've actually got an implementation that spans these applications. Now, um, in the case of uh, Sienna and Blue Planet, they had demonstrated that they could solve a range of problems, you know, across fulfilment and billing, as well as um, assurance, um, that gave us confidence that, you know, there was a genuine out-of-the-box capability, because clearly, like most customers, you want to minimise the tech debt or bespoke development that you have to build. Yeah, really good point. And the fact that Blue Planet and Digit had worked together on on some past implementations, whether it's uh, the catalyst that you mentioned and maybe another customer or two, that perhaps you even got a few free kicks, a little bit of a reduction in the integration tax because they'd already built some of the uh, integration between each other. Oh, absolutely. And um, uh, that, that, that is certainly the case. But I think also we should underscore it's more than just an API. And it's probably worth us touching on and expanding on a little bit about, you know, what is meant by this dynamic architecture. But but I'll just say that the APIs um, need to be supported by a common information model. And, um, uh, you know, these partners not only support those APIs, but also have common language in terms of how how to implement those catalogue models and um, and certainly is the case um, with a global player like Sienna where they've implemented this, you know, these sort of complex enterprise level, you know, network products with other carriers, you get the benefit of um, some of these out-of-the-box solutions. So Sienna has got this notion of, you know, vertically integrated solutions that can take a particular network vendor, in our case it's um, Arista, um, together with a set of sort of standard service models that are perhaps vendor agnostic, and they can translate those out of the box. They can translate those service constructs into the network activation configuration required on a per vendor uh, basis. So that's a that's a huge that's a huge advantage. I found it really interesting that you really picked and chose between uh, which of TM Forum, which of the MEF LSO data patterns to use. Was that 
blending of standards a really tricky decision and do you expect that there will be ongoing ramifications like tech debt or benefits perhaps coming from the way that you chose what you did? Yeah, yeah, good question. Actually, well, I don't really see it as an us versus them type mm. thing. Um, both the MIF and the TMF have, have our respective strengths. Here at Focus, we use the TMF for the APIs themselves. Think of that as the, the sort of header and framework, if you like, for the APIs. And we certainly use the tele-management forum um, information model as the, as the basis of our enterprise-level payloads. But when it comes to modelling service and network constructs, mm. we use MEF. We use MEF to drive what we call the customer-facing resources and the resource-facing services and all of the attributes that stand alongside that. And think about our external APIs, our suppliers and potentially even our wholesale customers. They're all interested in our network product offerings and they all expect MEF-aligned data models to support not only those operational interfaces but also their inventory so I guess this blending is sort of a natural fit. And just to underscore it, where MEF is strong is obviously in those the sort of service and network constructs, and we're able to leverage this dynamic architecture, this payload-driven um, approach to, to drive particularly the sort of service activation, service inventory, service order management uh, type APIs with a MEF-type payload. Mm. And often when we talk about those APIs, we're talking about it for only exposure to internal teams, like maybe it's the portal developers or the northbound systems to interact with. But I really feel like some of the potential around that is exposure externally. So opening up that potential for a long tail of innovation for other developers to come in and take some of your product offerings and blend it with mm. with some others. Is that something that's part of your thinking as well? And do you see some potential in that? Yeah, I think there's probably two ways that I'd, I'd tackle that question. Um, specific to focus and what we're doing in Future State, um, absolutely. So this, you know, central to this notion of both self-serving, allowing our customers to self-serve, but in ways that make sense to them. The technology stack, if you want to think of it, is broken down in terms of design time and runtime. So at design time, we define our product offerings. And at Focus, we have a very tightly bound um, set of what I would call commodity um, customer-facing services. They are reusable service components, that are well-defined, but when we go up towards the product constructs and the product offerings, we can blend those in a multitude of different ways, and we don't want to overly constrain um, the way that we do those offerings. Now, that catalogue is defined at runtime, the way in which we build our, our products, and all of the validation rules and all of that sort of stuff is codified within the catalogue. That catalogue is discoverable. At runtime, we need our consumers to be able to query the catalogue understand um, the offerings that are right for them and then be able to order price ashore, for example, at runtime. So coming back to that, our portal, for example, as I think you mentioned, rightly consumes that catalogue. So it can uh, discover those set of offerings and consumes the uh, product order management and, and inventory, for example, and price books and quoting APIs and all of that sort of good stuff that we can render a particular journey that is based on the type of customer that uh, that we're interacting with, Effect effectively what we call a persona. So we can build flexible journeys based on the underlying uh, APIs that we've exposed. But similarly for B2B, we want to do exactly the same thing. We want to be able to support our customers discovering um, our catalogue to be able to, to, to do um, intent-based queries to sort of say, well, okay, I'm, I'm really interested in a data connectivity product with these type of characteristics. What have you got on offer? Okay, we've got, you know, an IP WAN offering or, a, or an SD WAN offering or an Ethernet offering. And then understanding where the customer wants to deliver those endpoints of the services and understanding the capabilities that are exposed at that particular site, we can then further qualify the applicability of that offering to the customer. So all of that flexibility and richness um, we, we want to provide. But... What I've been talking about is really geared towards Focus's customer, and that customer is obviously a, uh, a customer that's interested primarily in a complex enterprise-level uh, network or, or managed service. 
when I step out of my thinking about Vogus and, and reflect more broadly at the opportunities that I think these APIs um, and this dynamic architecture provides, uh, more and more when we think about our digitally connected world where we want to be able to support innovation, where perhaps a, a telecommunication service, either you know, infrastructure or cloud-based, is only a part of that overall digital service offering, um, then these APIs, the ability of having a catalogue that's discoverable, a price book that's discoverable, and uh, exposing this as a set of very fine-grained um, technologies that can be rapidly built together in innovative ways by consumers that are not necessarily telecommunication service providers, I think is, is something that is on the horizon for us. And when you think about it purely from a, a service provider standpoint where some would think of us as just a utility, then um, so-called bums on seats or getting services in operation, being able to make that, that network capability, that asset, if you will, available to, uh, to non-traditional players, super important. Yeah, absolutely. It really excites me. I guess it's the we've gone through that phase where a new business model of the MVNOs arose maybe a few decades ago, but now that potential to do the digital virtual operators that use the the platforms of other network providers and create mm -hmm. really innovative service offerings or bundles. Yeah, and Ryan, I think just in closing off on that sort of thought as well is that it's it's not just about APIs. I come back to the really smart, intelligent capabilities that we've got in our, our modern networks these days. So traditionally, you have this notion of, well, I'm, I'm buying a particular service and I'm buying it at this particular speed and I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to get charged on a monthly basis at that speed and boy, oh boy, the commercial constructs are, if I, if I flex my speed up or down, there's invariably commercial hoops that I've got to jump through. Mm -hmm. We see the industry moving more and more away from a usage-based approach. And um, when I think about the flexibility that's available um, on these software-defined networks, you want to be able to allow customers to be able to go in and, you know, flex bandwidth in very small increments, almost, you know, like a little dial for, you know, variable periods of time that best suit them. So, for example, we can envisage a circumstance where, uh, you know, a, a customer's got a data connectivity between, a, 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 you know, a corporate site and a data centre. And during the day, they want to dial that capability up to bias towards their corporate traffic, perhaps their internet traffic. But at night when they're doing um, site backups and this sort of stuff, you want to be able to dial the service more towards that nature. And that has, um, that has implications in terms of the way in which you're prioritising and managing traffic for that customer across the network. That level of flexibility um, supported by those innovative product offerings through a simple, intuitive, easy-to-use interface with simple commercial constructs that are easy to understand, I think you start to get a sense of, of where the vision is within our, uh, within our industry. Yeah, absolutely. It's really exciting stuff. And I really love the, the concept, too, of it all being catalogue driven. So with the CFS, RFS, orchestration plans around that. One of my concerns, though, is that the SKU counts, the um, product offerings, have that potential to proliferate if the product teams get overzealous again. Have you needed to do anything to, to mitigate that? Or is the fact that that northbound interface says here's a more restricted offering and you do the, the bundling more with the, that PSR, CFS type? Yeah, well, it's interesting, you know, one of, you know, standardizations, you could almost look at it as a double-edged sword. You know, the benefits of standardization is commonality, but um, you've got to be really mindful that, you've got to differentiate yourself in the marketplace. You know, you don't want to be going out with the same sort of products and, and constructs. So, so how do you achieve that? And the last thing that we want to do is put too many guardrails on our ability to innovate in the market. Having said that, we don't want to go back to those bad old days of large skew counts and unstructured orders and incomplete inventory and this sort of stuff. So I have touched on it, but the way that we achieve it as you rightly call out, is through that uh, product service resource model. And that effectively means that 
you can't do anything within our BSS stack that isn't defined in the catalogue. So what we want to be able to do is um, introduce an ability to rapidly build those market-facing offerings and launch them in the marketplace. And we do that uh, through a combination of having a tightly bound or constrained set of um, service components, what we call the customer-facing services, and a simple ability for our products people to be able to coordinate those or build those into very flexible offerings. And it's not just the catalogue, but it's also um, the price books that go alongside that. So the, and I think the other key thing is to have that sort of single catalogue that can be rapidly distributed around the applications that need it. So what, you know, very simply put, if we have a new network capability, we could rapidly integrate that network capability into our service catalogue that's uh, exposed uh, through Signal Blue Planet now OSS. That's immediately visible and available to our uh, product catalogue at design time. So we can now go and rapidly form up that uh, market offering in the pricing constructs. Uh, once that is effectively deployed into our production environment, it's automatically synchronised across our configure price quote solution, our product order management orchestration layer, and of course our billing platform. So right there, it's available uh, for our customer facing portals to be ordered. We've got uh, very flexible dynamic pricing and quoting mechanisms that are around that. So it can be priced up and then of course flow through to orchestration for fulfillment and then through onto billing. So a long-winded way of saying that we welcome and encourage the flexibility to innovate in the market, but through this dynamic architecture, um, we're able to make sure that we maintain integrity both across our BSS and OSS. So that's the vision. Mm. And when you talk about flexible pricing, are we talking flex and surge type pricing or is it um, more flexible on a week by week, month by month type basis? Um, yeah, it's, it's probably both. Actually, when I was thinking about flexible pricing, when I think about those SKUs, um, the reason we had so many of them is that every permutation and combination of orderable information that could impact the price had a separate SKU. So when I thought when, when I think about that fle uh, flexible pricing, one element of that is what we call the dynamic pricing. In our catalog, we might have an Ethernet product, for example, and that Ethernet product, the price, the standard price book can be driven by parameters like, you know, the obvious things like speed, um, the type of access technology that we're, that we're building out, the assurance level that you want, contract term, mm. for example, it might be the number of licenses, all, all that sort of standard stuff that you can bring together in a, in a, in a runtime approach to arrive at a particular price. Of course, we've got the ability for our salespeople to negotiate that price with customers. Uh, but yes, th then beyond that, our standard constructs, and this particularly relates to some of our um, our aggregated sort of transit products, we have the ability to have what you call sort of surge pricing or aggregate pricing that's based on um, usage across multiple trunks, that sort of stuff here. Yeah, all, all, all of that sort of stuff is um, supported. Fantastic. I know from working with you that you're really adept at making transformations about the business outcomes rather than just playing out some sort of personal tech fantasy. The numbers appear to be quite strong on the transformation you've undertaken, just on the back of things like the 60,000 SKUs and the, mm. the eight BSSs that you're consolidating and things like that. Mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions for the listeners about how to make digital transformation business cases more compelling? Maybe not just this one, but other past successes as well. Um, yes, well, I mean, it stands to reason that any business case has got to clearly define the metrics and where we can tend to get a bit wishy-washy in terms of those indirect benefits. So I guess in my experience, it's really important that you root that transformation to, you know, to tangible benefits. And for us, it essentially relates to uh, either cost out. So, you know, we're, we're, we're being specific about, you know, the benefits in reducing man manual handling, perhaps reducing fallout, increasing you know customer self-service a set of metrics or benefits around customer experience so for us the concrete stuff that we measure around that sort of increasing right first time perhaps decreasing connection or restoration service levels um, increased NPS things that are tangible and measurable but then also 
Um, there's the ability to scale or grow your market share. And obviously, you know, those things need to be tied back to um, hard revenue targets. And in our case, those revenue targets are typically linked back to particular, you know, market or product segments as well. Mm. Similar to that. So we talked a little bit earlier about the common data model being really important mm. and heavily investing in that to get it right. Well, and also the consolidation. Are you seeing the fruits of those labours in terms of data insight generation or is that going to be more like next phase? Because I know you're still in the middle of this transformation and uh, what it's going to deliver. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah, I think truth be told, uh, early days around the insights, but let me just step back a bit. And you'll remember at the start of our conversation, I was calling out some of the pain points, the fact that we've got these silos, the fact that we've got incomplete data, and that causes problems for all of the obvious reasons. So our first motivation was to make sure that we had no air gaps in our inventory and we were data complete. What do we mean by that? Air gaps are where at design time, you haven't joined information that you later understand is necessary. It relates to the schemas that are, that, you know, that are incomplete. The data quality issues being data complete means, that, yeah, okay, your schema allows for it, but for whatever reason, you haven't got mandatory validation rules, whatever it might be, you don't have a complete picture of that particular inventory. We needed to tackle that in the first instance. And the way that we went about that is that we, we undertook and defined um, an enterprise information model. That's effective, if you want to think of it, it's effectively the enterprise logical model that would sit for one of a better word in your enterprise data warehouse. But that effectively defines all of the key information that we need, the characteristics around that information, and obviously the relationships across that. And when we built that EIM, we built it through the perspective of the processes. So we looked at our 2B processes, you know, informed by those metrics that, you know, that we wanted to, to, to achieve and made sure that each step of that process was supported by the right information. And when it came to um, building out that EIM, we were, you know, we, we took some guidance from uh, the Telling Management Forum SID, but not religious guidance because it's it's massive. Again, we sort of, we, we focused on what was relevant to focus, informed by those particular processes. And that in turn helped us define not only the common information models for the new applications that we were standing up in future state, but also really importantly informed the migration activities that we had to undertake from our legacy uh, platforms to our 2B platforms. So right now, we are confident that we've got a data model that um, supports all of the sort of enterprise reporting, performance reporting, and also is data complete to be able to support not only, you know, standard handoff from, from fulfilment to assurance, but also, as I mentioned a bit earlier, our aspiration heading towards that sort of closed loop automation. Mm. But to getting back to your point around customer insights, et cetera, we are well positioned. Here at Focus, we use um, uh, Salesforce as our CRM, and there is a very strong linkage between, if you like, the on-platform data models within Salesforce that relate to, uh, you know, the sales forecasting and opportunities and um uh, and revenues, et cetera, that's going to give us those insights. But also importantly, when we think about the assurance side and case management, all of that sort of stuff is joined up. So we can see not only what the intent is for our customers and what that might mean in terms of future sales opportunities, but also we can get uh, insights into how we're performing for our customers um, in terms of being able to serve uh, serve their, their needs. So I would say We've got the foundations in place uh, and we're working towards leveraging some of the benefits around those insights. Fantastic. And earlier on, we touched about that this whole podcast was probably spawned by the video that you put out on YouTube from the TM Forum event. And I've got to thank you for, for sharing that too, because it provides some brilliant insights. And I'll put that in the show notes for people to go and watch. Without spoiling some of the punchlines uh, from that, there were some follow-up questions at the end asked by the audience and, again, the great call-outs that you made there. You were able to share with people who are about to embark on a similar journey of transformation, things to look out for, um, guiding hints and tips. Yeah, well, look, um, transformation is a good word, isn't it? You could probably drive a truck through it. Um, I think you've got to have clear line of sight 
to your vision and the metrics that matter. And for us, um, there, you know, there are a few things and they relate to that sort of mantra of, um, you know, brilliant simplicity. We were very customer focused. Everything that we did um, was informed by um, customer journeys. And so I think having that clear, if you like, laser focus on the couple of metrics that matter, holding yourself to account both when you're doing the design and as you deploy um, and measure, you know, those, those benefits, obviously super important. But I also think beyond the sort of business perspective of that transformation, it's really important if you're going to partner to really test the credentials and capabilities of your partners. I would share two observations. One, that there's obviously a benefit with going with a large global player. And that benefit is essentially you get the benefit of a rich product roadmap that's informed by, you know, the work that they're doing with similar related customers. But there's a flip side of that too. And certainly for Vocus, where we're not, uh, you know, a large player, um, that you are but one voice um, in trying to steer that ship. And so establishing those good relationships with your vendors and your and your product team is important. But I reflect on some of the advantage with going with some of the more nimble players and, and Digit's an example of that where we're able to partner with them um, in, you know, in very useful and meaningful ways. So they share our vision and we're able to sort of help really steer their roadmap and, um, and that, benefits, um, that benefits us, obviously. Yeah, really important call-outs too because you, you're getting the benefit of having uh, a group of people who've experienced multiple times before, whereas you and your organisation may only do one transformation, they're doing multiple as they go from mm-hmm. customer to customer and there's that aggregate of learning. Uh, but also in the, the video you touched on the importance of you may delegate and you may bring on that experience from externals, mm-hmm. but you still retain accountability for, mm-hmm. for everything that happens and making sure that you're not delegating all responsibility as well. Oh, so true. And um, I'm sure we can all reflect on various times in our career um, where we may have, uh, have outsourced uh, sort of too much and with the, with the aspiration that, sure, these partners will play nice together. No, look, at the end of the day, as a solution architect, um, you've got to recognise that the accountability sits within within our organisation. Our role, again, being to define that sort of coherent end to end solution um, and capabilities. But you've got to retain you've got to retain ownership of that, and uh, and that's uh, certainly the case. So we we certainly partner. We welcome insights from our partners, and in fact, expect our partners to be able to to some extent be thought leaders and 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 help guide us but at the end of the day you know we've got to eat our own dog food don't we and the buck stops mm. with us so yes we, we retain we certainly retain overall um, accountability for our solution mm. all right so getting really close to the end of the mm-hmm. podcast now what do you feel like the future holds for oss telco especially for telcos like vocus the challenger telcos and how are you positioning for it yeah, well, I think um, as I as I sort of touched on earlier, that ability to self serve support very flexible interactions with all types of customers in ways and mechanisms that make sense to them, I think is going to be a continuing trend. I also think that uh, more broadly, again, if I step outside of uh, Vocus and think more broadly for our industry, it's about enabling that sort of if you like, that sort of digital economy. And I think key elements of that, I've touched on sort of fine-grained open APIs with low barriers of adoption, meaning, you know, you don't necessarily have to be um, a carriage service provider, but also working with innovators in this space to really adopt um, those capabilities. Digital ecosystems, digital marketplaces, um, less around point-to-point sort of integrations on B2B and more about point-to-multi-point, super, super important. And so, therefore, I think there's going to be, there's going to be a, a continuing focus on standardisation. And I think for those that are going to listen to, to the forum that I was involved in, one of the other call-outs that I made was that I'd like to see a greater harmonisation, standardisation between TMF and, and, and MIF. They've started. 
but there's a way to go. But I also think that catalogue driven approach, the discoverability of uh, offerings and network services and, and even things like field services that could be made available and blended in innovative ways by folks that see, you know, network services as just a component of a digital offering, I think is um, is an important part of our future. Brilliant. So really appreciated the chat today, Martin. I found some fascinating insights. And again, thanks again for sharing today, but also in that video. If people wanted to continue the conversation, where can they find you? Oh, well, I'm on, uh, I'm on LinkedIn, so uh, feel free to, uh, to look me up and, and reach out. I'm very happy to connect. Brilliant. All right, well, thank you once again, and thanks also for the audience for uh, listening in to today's episode, and we look forward to getting another episode out to you shortly. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for listening to the Passionate About OSS podcast. You can find more episodes more than 2,500 blogs and our contact details over at passionateaboutoss.com.